So Billy Redding is an architectural historian and author who has worked on in, as an inspector of historical buildings and areas of historical England for over a decade. Through his work, he is lead heritage advisor to Whitehall departments and royal palaces in London. Billy is recognised as the leading expert on the historic fire stages of Britain and has wide ranging interests within the field of architecture from the medieval manor house to brutalism and beyond. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and hand you over to Billy. Please leave microphones on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary, for that fantastic introduction. So I'm now going to attempt to share my screen with you all. Uh, here we go. And begin the slideshow. Joanna, can you give me a thumbs up if that's successfully? But yes, it has. Great. Good news. The technology is working with us to start with, which I'm happy to see. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to put this talk on the fire stations of Chingford together. It's been really interesting to research. Um, I'm only sad that I haven't been able to spend any time at the archives. I've had to do all of my research for this online. So there might be some gaps, but um, I'm addressing a very knowledgeable group of people uh, with a specialism in, in this area. So perhaps at the end, you can tell me what it is that I've missed, got wrong, not mentioned or, or, or what have you. Um, so we have a presentation on fire stations, brief architectural history via Chingford and we can, um, I'm sure anyone who lives in Chingford will know the building on the left is Chingford's current fire station. And I'm sure any member of the Chingford Historical Society will know that the building on the right is Chingford's Victorian fire station, which is now a uh, car showroom, evidently. Um, but before these buildings, going back, how was firefighting handled historically and uh, the, the fire station as a building typology, where did, where did that come from it, it is the question that we start with. Um, so it, I mean, firefighting stretches right back into antiquity and the, the necessity for a specialist building comes out of a development of the, uh, the firefighting equipment as, as that has um, grown and adapted uh, through time. So we know that the Romans had specialist equipment for fighting fires. This slightly blurry picture is a, um, uh, a pump, which uh, it, it's an illustration of an item that was excavated at Silchester Hill. So we know the Romans used this tool in Britain. Um, it's uh, a pump that can bring water up so that you can fight it, uh, you, can, you can direct it towards the fire. Um, the Romans had an organized system of firefighting and uh, they were, uh, it was a sort of armed forces structure. They were called vigils, firefighters, and they, uh, like an army, they, they, they would have a core of firefighters. Um, so we know that they were used in England, these, these uh, pumps. Um, but after the Romans and post-Roman Britain, uh, things were a little bit more community-based, and the main tool for fighting a fire in medieval England would be the bucket, not very glamorous, uh, the human chain, the axe, and uh, ladders, that sort of thing. So this illustration shows you the bucket is here, it's a leather bucket, they use canvas ones as well to keep the weight down so that as they're passed, uh, it doesn't slow you down. Um, often you find fire fighting buckets uh, are narrow at the top and fat at the bottom. This one happened not to be, but uh, obviously that's to reduce spills as they get passed along. Um, and this is really a community event. This is a situation that requires everyone in the community to come together and put the fire out. Um, there's no specialism. It's just everyone helping, helping one another, forming a human chain from the nearest source of water, the well or the stream or the pond, uh, and passing the buckets backwards and forwards throwing them at the fire. It's really as simple as that. Uh, the ladders and the uh, pike. This is a pike, um, which is a hook because the building materials in medieval Britain are a timber and a thatch. In fact, this is very flammable materials and buildings tend to be built up close to one another. So it's really in the interests of everybody to put out the fire before it spreads. And if you want to put out a fire and a thatch roof, your best bet is to pull the thatch down and put it out on the ground. So this pike, which is a, effectively a hook on a stick, 
is designed to, to pull burning thatch off the roof. The, the picture on the right, it's not very clear, but it's actually a pike uh, on the side of a barn. And if you drive around in villages, occasionally you, you still see these things, um, that they're, they're sort of, uh, they're a community asset because the, the whole community has to get involved in putting out fires. It's in everyone's interest, as I said. Um, so Chingford, in Chingford, um, there's, the, the illustration is not Chingford, I hasten to add, um, but it, it's an indication of sort of vernacular buildings. So uh, thatch, as we said, closely packed together. Um, Chingford grew up as small settlements, Chingford Green in the north, Low Street in the northwest, Chingford Hatch in the east. And each of these settlements is about a mile from the parish church at Chingford Mount. Um, elsewhere in the parish, there would have been scattered farms, cottages, and, and a few larger houses. So how would a parish like this organize its firefighting? And the answer is, that this is most likely Chingford's first fire station, you could call it. Um, so Chingford Old Church uh, will be centrally located to all of these settlements and hamlets and farmhouses. Uh, and things in the medieval period are organized around ecclesiastical boundaries, so vestries, uh, parishes. Uh, and churches were often, in most communities, the most convenient central place where a parish could store their equipment they can lever up against the tower, they can keep the pike against the wall, they can keep the buckets and the axes in the church porch. And it, it really is as simple as that. Um, so to, if, if there's a fire in your cottage, your neighbour's cottage, to sound the alarm, first of all, you'd go to the church. And I don't know if, if, if there are active bell ringers in, in Chingford, maybe someone who knows a bit about bell ringing can uh, improve on this item for me. But what I understand is, to raise the alarm in event of fire, they would ring a backwards peal. So normally the, the peal of bells would ring from the, the one with the highest note along and down to the tenor bell with the lowest note. So it would go from highest to lowest. And that would be a normal sort of peal of bells. In the event of a fire, they would ring a backwards peal. So they'd start with the tenor bell and ring up through to the highest note. And that at any time of day or night would alert the whole community to the fact that there's there's a situation and everyone would come to see what was happening grab a bucket get involved so the peal of bells being rung backwards is effectively sounding the alarm now in some parishes in some places um, agricultural buildings had to suffice instead of the church if the church is on the edge of a village or not very conveniently located um, uh, you will find that records indicate equipment is held in an agricultural building because really it's it's just a store building so someone will lend a corner of their barn like the timber framed example on the left we know that was a fire station it's in Wiltshire I forget exactly where um, because uh, the parish note that they added the doors for ease of, of of access and the small thatched example on the right is in Northamptonshire on the village green in a village where the church is sort of far from the village centre that was a purpose built store for communal equipment, including the fire fighting equipment. And the little sort of extra bit on the left was added later when the equipment developed. So this is a really early example of a very ordinary, as you can see, just a normal barn, a normal agricultural building being used by a parish to store their shared communal equipment. Um, so the idea of a fire engine come slightly later uh, into the 16th century. Um, and when we talk about early fire engines, we're talking about something like this. So it is a barrel on wheels, which you can fill with water. In the middle, it has something like uh, the, the Roman pump that we saw at the beginning, um, to which you can attach a nozzle. And that uh, this chap here is directing the water with the nozzle to fight the fire. Um, it requires one person to stand on it and do that, and probably four people to pump the levers up and down to get the water to move. So, like I said before, community event, everyone has to get involved, take their turn in pumping. It's in everyone's interest to put a fire out. Um, so this is the kind of thing, but these, these were fairly rare. This is a specialist bit of kit. An ordinary parish wouldn't have something like this. Um, and if you did, it wouldn't, certainly wouldn't fit in the church porch and it would take up a lot of space in a, 
kindly farmer's barn. So uh, it's going to need somewhere to live to keep it out of the rain. And this is where we start to get the very first uh, engine houses. They're always called engine houses in this early period. Uh, so the example on the left, that's Castle Carey in Somerset. And it is a purpose-built engine house. It's actually built into the churchyard wall. So it's still that same idea of the communal equipment being kept at the parish church because it's the centre, the sort of focus of the community. Uh, and it's probably in the middle of the, of the settlement. Um, so that one is Castle Kerry. The one on the right, it's a lovely little building, slightly later, but I use it to, to illustrate the point. It's in, hmm, I want to say Barrow upon Saw in Leicestershire, I think. I, I take pictures of fire, fire buildings everywhere I go, and sometimes I forget where I've been. But I think it's Barrow upon Saw, and I think that's in Leicestershire. And that's a charming little building. I looked up its uh, history when I read the plaque on the front, and it is used as a watch house. Uh, it's used to store the village hearse. It's used to store the firefighting equipment. It's used as the village lockup. Uh, it's so all sorts of community uses that building has been pressed into, um, but purpose built to to fulfill those those needs um, in the middle of the village there. And now it is a tiny arts gallery and very lovely it is too. Um, so these are the earliest sort of purpose built engine houses that that you'll find. Things change in the firefighting world at a rather significant date, which no doubt everybody will recognize a place and date there. And so this is a cataclysmic date for firefighting history. And um, two, two major changes come out of this event. Um, so the, the sort of engines that I showed you before, the barrels on wheels, they, London did have things like this in 1666. Famously, there was one in Clerkenwell at the parish church there. And when the Great Fire of London was underway, the Clerkenwell pump was brought all the way down to London Bridge and uh, the, the Thames was very low during that time. Uh, the tide was out when they, when they arrived with this pump and they tried to, they had to fill it with water. So they tried to bring it up to the water's edge to get this thing filled with water and it fell into the river and was completely uh, destroyed and totally useless. So it didn't help at all in putting the, putting the fire out. Um, but that was a fairly rare thing to have. Clerkenwell must have been a wealthy parish to have their own fire um, tender at, at that early stage. After 1666, then the technology develops, so the fire engines, as we still call them, start to get more technologically advanced, and they are starting to appear in parishes, in country houses, often aristocrats by their own, have their own uh, equipment. Um, so, so that's one of the developments that comes out of the Great Fire of London. The other one is famously the insurance brigades. This is the beginning of the insurance brigades. The very first one set up in 1667 by a chap called Nicholas Barbon, who is a fascinating uh, London uh, character, piece of hi our history. He, he developed a lot of Soho for the people displaced by the Great Fire. And he set up the first insurance company, this lovely little um, a statue I saw in Leamington Spa and it is on the, a former insurance building and you can see that they've got uh, axes and helmets and uh, they've got uh, buckets on the side. It's a lovely little thing uh, and it's there to illustrate the, the beginning of, the, of a different system which is um, something you pay for. So if you're uh, lucky enough to be able to afford it you can insure your property, your business premises against fire and the insurance companies to your local area will turn up eventually when you can get their attention by sending a boy and a horse probably um, to go and fetch them they will turn up and put your fire out. There's a, a common myth that the uh, insurance brigades would stand and watch buildings insured by other people burning and do nothing about it. Um, it's a nice story but it's, it's sort of shown not to be true uh, in that the insurance companies would pay their money to the other insurance companies if the sun insurance turned up first and put out a fire that was a building insured by Britannia then Britannia would pay back the sun for their time and effort so 
there was a, a great competition about who would arrive first. And they were sort of friendly competitors, I think, the, the insurance brigades. Um, and this is a great way into local history as well. These are a selection of uh, firefighting, uh, sorry, uh, insurance company plaques. They're called Fire Marks. Um, there's a fantastic book which tells you all of them. I can show you that at the end. Um, the left hand is obviously the Sun, again, the Sun Alliance. The one in the middle, I think, is called the, it had a very long and complicated name, which had the word mutual and I think the word friendship in it, but it was commonly known as the hand in hand. You can see why. The one at the bottom is from the Britannia Company, and the one on the right is the Royal, uh, sorry, it is um, the Royal Assurance. And you can see this fantastic building here, which we'll come back to. Um, so these are still to be found on many houses. I don't know if you'd find, I'm sure there are some in Chingford, there are some in Hackney, uh, and I'm sure they are out there to be found. And you can still look up the number. The, a lot of the insurance companies gave their records to the London Metropolitan Archives. So if you go to their website, the LMA website, you can actually look up the numbers and see who was living in the building or working from it at that time and what they had to ensure, sometimes even floor plans. There's an enormous resource there, or, uh, which is a, a fascinating sort of snapshot of uh, people at a certain time. So starting from the 1660s and, and, and really right through into the 18th and early 19th century, the insurance was the age of insurance companies. Um, and these are the marks that, that tell you where they've left their traces. Uh, here are some uh, firefighters. These are a volunteer brigade, as you can see on the left. This picture comes from Coventry slightly later, but it's there to sort of indicate that alongside the insurance brigade, there are often also volunteer brigades starting in the 1700s and, and running right through into the well, early mid 1800s. Um, so these chaps, this is this is really about the, the beginnings of professionalizing the brigade. Um, so you can see these chaps uh, looking very pleased with themselves. They've got the unit which became the Duriga firefighting uniform. The fact that they they're wearing a uniform and insignia that's branded um, is is really important because they're saying we're professionals. Um, we've got professional equipment and we are, we are firefighters. The hats they're wearing are really interesting. They would be uh, cork hats probably, uh, waxed or hardened to protect their heads from uh, falling debris in the, in the fire situation. The kind of hats you will still see at uh, Billingsgates, the old porters wear those sort of uh, bowler hats that are very tough because they carry the trays on their heads, but for a different reason, they, um, they wore those type of hats. Uh, you can tell it's a slightly later image, it's the only one I could actually find because they've got a, a turncock on the left hand side, which is to put into the um, water, like the under, underwater uh, conduits to, to release um, the water, but they've still got the same buckets, the, the leather buckets which are hanging on a swing hook on the top of their appliance there, um, and they're very proud looking volunteer fire brigade from Coventry, these chaps. So. The Royal Exchange, that was the name I was struggling for with the fire marks, my apologies. Um, this image is a really interesting image from a fire at the Royal Exchange at Bank, um, which was completely destroyed by fire twice in its history. On this occasion, we're looking at 1838, an illustration from the London Illustrated News. And it's, it's a striking image. Uh, and that, that central part of the building was illustrated on the fire plaque. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But if you can, I don't know what screens you're using, but if you can sort of squint and see what's going on with the figures in the foreground, you have horse-drawn appliances bringing firemen in on a cart. You have specialist pump carts, hose carts, which are being used, ladders up against the building. You have a, a sort of hydrant down here, which has been opened and is flooding the street with water. There's water pouring all the way down here. Uh, but critically, you have these figures in the bottom left hand corner and the chap there who's waving his bat on is telling the public to step back and this is the first time that you start to see that difference so whereas what we were talking about at the beginning the medieval uh, fire brigade the uh, firefighting was a community event everyone had to get involved pump the handles um, the insurance brigade would also they would have 
requirement for the, the handles to be pumped and water to be brought, human chains to bring water. So they would ask for volunteers and the insurance brigades famously would pay you if you volunteered in beer tokens. So if you worked hard, you know, backbreaking work, pumping the pump to bring the water up, that you'd get beer tokens at the end of all of that. Here in 1838, for the first time, we're seeing the public to being, being asked to step back and leave the professionals to get on with the job. And that's a, a real sort of turning point in the professionalization of the fire brigades. Still no municipal fire brigade at this time. It's still insurance companies and volunteers, but it's just the, the golden age of firefighting really. And that's the Victorian period. Illustrated by this fantastic chap, James Braidwood, who is commonly known and referred to as the father of modern firefighting. So he was, I've written these, these letters, I know they don't mean much and, and dates down so that I get it right. They're an aid memoir for me. So don't worry about this. Um, James Braidwood uh, started off in Edinburgh and he, Edinburgh had the first established municipal fire brigade in the UK. And that's 1824, the Edinburgh fire engine establishment. Um, this was in response to a, a terrible fire in the poor district of Edinburgh, many lives were lost. Um, and as always, it takes a cataclysm for anyone to do anything. So uh, in 1824, the uh, city burghers of Edinburgh came together and established the Edinburgh firefighting, sorry, fire engine establishment, the first in the UK. Um, and then the, I mean, the UK was very uh, sort of parochial uh, at this time. So really it was a, there was no national requirement to provide anything. Uh, it was entirely dependent on your parish, whether it was a wealthy or a poor parish, how much or how little equipment you had. And in Edinburgh in 1824, this is the first time that the authorities are actually involving themselves in firefighting. James Braidwood came in as the captain of the EFEE, and he was a, a, a slightly mad and sl completely wonderful person. He would have his uh, firemen drill in the dark to get them used to sort of situation, smoky situations where they can't see. He would have them up in the middle of the night doing drills and all sorts of things. He, he wrote a book, which is still in print, and he revolutionized the whole thing really he uh, patented all sorts of equipment that is um that took firefighting equipment forward he um he was the first person to realize that you can't just chuck water at the flames at the edge you have to get in and fight the seat of the fire which is still it, i mean it's true that's how you put out a fire and uh, he was the first person to, re to realize that and he, he wrote about that um, so I think this is really the reason why he's considered the, the, the father of modern firefighting. In 1833, he was poached from Edinburgh by London, and that's uh, the London Fire Engine Establishment, the this, this second entry that I've made there for myself. Uh, that was not a fully municipal brigade. This was the coming together of the 10 main insurance companies in London. Uh, so they, they pooled their resources. Uh, and set up a, a brigade that then could put out fires that weren't necessarily linked to the insured building. So effectively, private people were still paying the for, for the organized firefighting, but everyone was benefiting from it. So it was a bit of a trick. Um, James Braidwood uh, died fighting a fire, uh, the Great Fire of Tooley Street, which was 1861. Uh, he turned out with his men, they were fighting a blaze in warehouses on the south side of the River Thames. Um, Braidwood went to relieve the men. He went down an alleyway between two great gable walls of these burning buildings and one of the gable walls collapsed and killed him. Uh, the, the Great Fire of Tudor Street raged for a couple of weeks. It um, cost millions uh, in, in uh, loss and damage. Uh, and his funeral procession was a mile long. He had tributes from Queen Victoria. He was, he was considered a national hero. This was really newsworthy, uh, his story. Um, and so that was 1861. He died there are plaques in Tooley Street and there's a street called Braidwood Street. Uh, he's buried at Avenue Park Cemetery in Stone Yankton. And they brought a chap called uh, Captain Air Massey Shaw over from the Belfast Brigade because Londoners do love to poach other talent, still goes on. Uh, and Air Massey Shaw, um, he was really passionate about setting up 
a municipal brigade. And that's why we have MFB, 1866. It took him a few years, took the uh, city a few years to organize things, but they had set up the Metropolitan Board of Works. This is a time when the Victorians were very concerned with going for it. London was a network of little parishes, all very differently organized, a bit chaotic. And they'd set up the Metropolitan Board of Works in 1855, which then brought about the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in 1866. And um, so begins London's connection with municipal firefighting, although not Chingford. Chingford obviously is still outside of the boundaries of London at this time. Um, and I called it before the golden age of firefighting. This is the golden image of that golden age of firefighting. Um, this is called uh, Saved. The painting is called Sage. It's by a chap called Charles Vigor, painted in 1891. And um, the original has in a painting college uh, over at Moulton in Marsh. Um, and it, it really shows how the Victorians felt about th these, these firemen in there. Smart uniforms, the helmet, uh, Braidwood, um, Captain James Braidwood also designed that type of helmet with the high comb, they call it a comb, to, to break uh, pieces before it's a brass helmet. Um, and what a hero he is, undeniably, he's a hero. Um, so London begins to sort of form this Metropolitan Fire Brigade in the 1860s. The rest of the country is still very piecemeal, volunteer brigades, insurance brigades, private brigades, all sorts of things. Um, the last private insurance company brigade was actually the Norwich Union Brigade in Worcester. And they turned out for their last uh, fire call in 1925, so the situation you know, really did carry on. Uh, and volunteer brigades lasted even longer. In Oxford, for example, the colleges each had a volunteer brigade um, made up of students. And that, si that system worked so well for Oxford that the city council was never obliged to provide a formal um, fire brigade, a municipal fire brigade. So the first time that Oxford City got uh, municipal fire coverage, was actually when firefighting was nationalised in 1941. And before that, Oxford only had volunteer brigades, which is sort of astonishing to think of. Um, but this Victorian period, it's a period of rapid development, technological advancement, urbanisation, industrialization, improving construction and communication. So it's a very dynamic time and it proved that there was also real dynamism in, in fire stations. So technological advancements of firefighting equipment and that needed these these newly formed brigades needed a sort of civic presence they needed a professional identity and they used architecture to do that um, so in London the building this boom of fire stations um, became the responsibility for Metropolitan Board of Works uh, and they struggled to start with to find the correct sort of style to say we are civic heroes we're your local fire station so uh, here are some examples, the far left, uh, that one's in Hampstead with the mighty clock tower and the watch uh, tower above it so the firemen can be looking out and keeping you safe. Um, you can see Gothic architecture, this sort of uh, Dutch hipped gable going on here. This is a really civic building. Uh, the next one here is Whitechapel, again lots of uh, architectural detailing, brick banding, cornices here. And you've got these, these very fancy um, uh, sort of barge boards over the windows. There is a tower on that building. It's over the back. You can't see it from here. Uh, this next one here uh, on the right at the bottom there is um, Bishop's Gate. Uh, that's a fantastic building. It's still standing there. It is uh, Tesco's, now almost opposite of Liverpool Street Station. Um, really, they've thrown everything at this one. It's got a sort of French Empire roof and gothic four centered arch doors and you know everything in between it's got if you look at it can't see it in this picture obviously but there are firemen's helmets carved into the stonework that it's a riot of architecture the building on the right is um great marlborough street common garden sort of where liberties is uh, and it uh, doesn't exist anymore but again crow step dutch gable what, how fantastic what does that tell you they're, they're proud of this building this is a public building uh, and a building they can take pride in this one interesting it's a picture taken in the 60s and it's being used as a garage as many um derelict fire stations were including the one in um, a nice uh connection um, and I haven't chosen these four stations at random, although it might look that way, but they actually all have a Chingford connection. Uh, and that 
starts with this chap, who's Benjamin Vuliami, a clockmaker. This is a, a little bit of a tangent, but go with me. He, in the middle, is uh, Benjamin Vuliami, a Swiss clockmaker whose father came to the UK, um, based in Pall Mall. Uh, Benjamin had 14 sons. One of them, another Benjamin, carried on clockmaking, and his son was George John Vuliami, who designed all four of the fire stations in the previous slide, and many others, plus other civic buildings. He was the superintending architect to the Metropolitan Board of Works. He's most famous probably for designing the dolphin lamp standards all along the embankment, uh, also the base of Cleopatra's Needle, all of, the, all of the public realm along there basically, the lovely camel bench ends and all sorts. Uh, his uncle, one of Benjamin's other sons, was Lewis Fuliami and he designed Friday Hill House in Chingford, it turns out. Uh, Lewis was articled to um, not Bloor, oh, sorry, one of the other architects who worked at Buckingham Palace. Uh, Smirk, Robert Smirk trained Lewis Williami and George John was trained by uh, Charles Barry uh, of Houses of Parliament fame. Uh, and I can't believe that George John as a 20 something year old sort of articles trainee architect did not take the trip to Chingford in the 1830s, where his uncle was responsible for building this fantastic house. Um, and then perhaps those Dutch gables at the end might have inspired, I'm possibly making a connection too far there, but nevertheless, the Vulliami family have a great tradition with Chingford and with Fire Brigade. Um, and that brings us to this lovely little building in Chingford, uh, which was built by the Chingford Urban District Council. They were set up in 1895, I believe. By 1899, certainly, they had built this station. And you can see that it, it's a simple building. It's a legacy of those agricultural buildings that we saw before, single story, a hip at one end, but with some architectural embellishments. It has at the front this lovely uh, four-centered Gothic arch. It has some molding detail. The gable has been truncated, you'll see why. Um, and and that, that civic pride happening right there. So as the fire station building boom all across London, all across the, the major cities and towns of the UK did not escape Chingford. This, this lovely little building was built in the late 1890s and the volunteer brigade, there was still a volunteer brigade, although once the Urban District Council was set up, they raised trip to supply the brigade with better equipment. Um, so they got uh, tunics for the first time, they had a uniform to make themselves look professional, and then they really spent time and effort trying to get a telegraph system in place so that they could be summoned quickly and that would go to the fireman's houses. It was connected by the post office, the police station, they were, they were, they were trying to connect all these things up. Um, so the picture on the left there is Chingford's first ever fire engine. It is a uh, horse-drawn cart, agricultural cart, that has been adapted to carry the hoses, the buckets, the, the equipment that they had. Um, and the picture on the right, you can see, we can date that to after 1899. Um, this is, uh, this is the fire station in, in the background. And you can see now uh, why that gable is created because there is a plaque up here actually, which says CUDC, Chingford. Urban District Council, which is is no longer there. So that's why the gable doesn't rise to a point. It, it, it had this big plaque on. And unfortunately, in that picture, we can't see what happened on top of that. But I can't imagine it was nothing. I imagine there was there was more brickwork above. Um, the volunteer brigade, this is a slightly later picture because they have a, a van there on the right, which I suspect is one of the volunteers. It, it's probably connected with, with their work and is, is not actually belonging to the fire brigade. If you think of um, Dad's army, they always drive around in Jones's van, which has sort of butchers on the side. And this is almost exactly the same van that they must have used in, in filming that. So I suspect that's that's what that is. It's probably the local baker's van or something. But on the left, we know from uh, from records that they were furnished with one horse hose cart with 1,500 feet of canvas hose, five branches, three standpipes, a breaching piece, a hand pump, six canvas buckets, six lengths of ladder, which was 22 feet when extended, uh, nozzles, etc. cetera. Um, and we know that in uh, 1902, consideration was given to purchasing a steam appliance, um, but this was considered too expensive and was dropped in favor of a two horse escape tender. And I suspect 
very much that what we're looking at here is the two horse escaped tender that they bought in 1902. So this was a Shand Mason tender made in Blackfriars with three telescopic ladders, which you can just see poking out here, reaching up to 40 feet. And it was no noted down as being bright red and gilt, which sounds fabulous. Um, so they had this from 1902 and in 19... 24, this is jumping ahead slightly, they were very keen to buy a new motorized appliance, but they couldn't raise the 1,700 pounds necessary. So the resourceful fireman of Chingford instead purchased a motor chassis and adapted their previous tender um, by taking it apart and, and remounting the ladders onto the standard motor chassis. And that is what I think we're looking at here. Um, we know that they ceased using that. They're still in front of the same building. You can see the Gothic arch in the background and they ceased using that building in 1929. So we can be pretty confident that this picture dates from between 1924 and 1929. Fantastic picture and fantastic resourcefulness. You know, they didn't have the money to buy the fancy motorized appliance that everyone was getting in the twenties. So they made their own, good on them. I think that's fantastic. Um, so to step back, we were at the end of the Victorian period, the uh, Edwardian period, they doubled the amount of fire stations in London, it was another great big building, boom, because the equipment was evolving so quickly, technological advancement was moving along, um, so four Edwardian stations to show you here, they're still really struggling to find the right architectural style for fire stations, um, so Waterloo, top left, is in a sort of Queen Anne, sort of Renaissance classical, uh, style, that's uh, Knightsbridge uh, on the top right, it's even more classical. Bottom left is Perry Vale, um, which is, that, that I would call Edwardian freestyle, so there was a, a group of architects. Um, so the, the Metropolitan Board of Works ceased in 1896, um, around the same time they brought in the Urban uh, District Councils, London's uh, Metropolitan uh, Authority was replaced with the London County Council. Uh, so a new group of architects came in, and they were very concerned with architecture and, and they spent a lot of time on the fantastic housing projects at Boundary Lane Estate in Spitalfields and the other one in Pimlico, the name of which will come back to me in about five minutes. Um, but they also invested a lot of time in fire stations and this building in Perivale is clear, like Edwardian freestyle. They were not so into the modernism that was going across Europe. They thought that Gothic was French classical is Italian and they wanted an English style. So you can see that lovely building at Perivale, 1901 uh, with its tower and its lovely canted bay windows. It, it's English vernacular, but modern. Uh, it's taken up to a bigger scale and it's using modern materials and construction techniques. Um, and this, this building bottom right, I implore you to look it up online. It is called uh, Bell Size Fire Station. Um, it's one of the ones that really got my, me excited about fire stations. It's two star listed and it's uh, recently been converted into flats. The brigade moved out in 2010. It's well worth looking up. There are fantastic images of it. It defies architectural categorization. Fantastically mad building. And you can see the brickwork detailing on the tower. There is nothing like it. It doesn't fit any box. It's completely unique and, and, and wonderful for it. And again, these are four Edwardian fire stations in London. I've not chosen them randomly. I've chosen them because they have a Chingford connection. And that is this chap here, excuse the watermark image, but um, I hope you can all tell Charles Cannon-Mill, who is one of my architectural heroes. Uh, fantastic chap. And he uh, had a great career with the London County Council. He built all sorts of stuff, lots of fire stations. Uh, he was he was sorry, born in Billy, Plasto, but he Billy, sorry, sorry yes he lost that last piece there. Uh, can you just give us his name again, please? Sorry, yeah. Where did you lose from? Just his name. Just from his name, yeah. Sorry about that. His name is Charles Canning Windmill, and he's my architectural or whatever many. Um, he was born in Plasto. Uh, he was superintending architect to the London County Council and uh, he was an Essex man, he has an Essex family, and when he retired, he lived all over the place, but when he retired, uh, he moved to Rochester, and he, uh, he, he was very involved with the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, the SPAB, and he was uh, their church's advisor for Essex and Kent, uh, and in that capacity, he came to Chingford uh, when your beautiful All Saints Church was a picturesque ruin, 
the uh, roof had collapsed and most architects who were brought to advise on it said, there's nothing to save, get rid of it. Uh, Charles Canning Windmill came along and said, we can do something with this. And he re-roofed it and uh, saved the building uh, in a beautiful arts and crafts style and uh, good on him. So we thank Charles Canning Windmill and we also appreciate his wonderful legacy of fire stations across London and beyond. This brings us up to the 1920s and the uh, Urban District Council looking to uh, build themselves a town hall and many other councils were building in a sort of strip back system. So uh, Chingford went for uh, neo-baroque and uh, I'm really glad they did because I think that's a fantastic building, very domestic, very lovely. Um, it, you'll all know it, it and I believe it's been converted into flats now and the piece that was on the left hand side uh, which is subsequently demolished was Chingford second fire station so the very small building that we saw this which is in is it Kings Road or Kings Avenue uh, that's now the car showroom was too small by the 20s the motorized appliances were bigger wider they didn't fit through the doors this is why there were so many new stations being built because the equipment got bigger um, and I can't, I'm afraid of being online research only, I can't show you a great picture of, of the fire station that was there on the left, but you can just hopefully make out that uh, here on the left of the town hall, uh, there's a band there and some doors. That's this here, which says fire station across the top. Uh, the, the station's sort of off on one side of one picture and the other side of the other. So I'm sorry it's not a clear picture, but but they look pleased with themselves anyway. And they got a brand new top spec uh, uh, town hall in 1929. Um, so all of the horses were phased out. The last, uh, in the 1920s, they moved to, to uh, mechanized appliances. They moved to the watch system, which they still operate today. Um, the last horses that ran out on a job uh, were from Kensington station. They were a pair of brigade greys called Lucy and Nora. Uh, and they ran out in, I think, 1925. Um, but we already have motorized appliances in Chingford. We were ahead of that curve um, and they were housed here at the town hall. So then it's just a short step to 1938 when the auxiliary fire service was formed with the uh, increasing threat of aerial invasion because of the European war. Uh, an auxiliary fire service was formed. Now, still, we have piecemeal local provision across the country. So you have private brigades, you have the um, factories quite often had their own brigades. In many places, they brought in when they were required in the late 19th century to provide a fire brigade. Many other places um, just asked the police to do it. So you have what are called police fire brigades, which is usually a garage on the back of a police station. Um, you have more organised brigades like London, you've still got um, all sorts of different and disparate organisations. In fact, at the outbreak of war, they had 1,668 different brigades across the country. Um, when you've got 1,668 different brigades to coordinate, what you do, you create an auxiliary fire service and supplement them with a different system, with more different people doing different things and not talking to anyone else. So the auxiliary fire service sprang up in 38. They put buildings all over the place and um, they did their own building. So I illustrate here that really they are very piecemeal buildings. They're very temporary in nature. Obviously, they've got a bigger thing to worry about than commissioning fancy civic architecture. So the one on the left is in Sussex. I want to say Uckfield. I might be wrong. You would pass that building and not give it a second thought. But actually, it's got a really important history as a, a auxiliary fire service station sort of uh, wrinkly tin. And the building on the right, I think is somewhere in maybe Hertfordshire, maybe like Leighton Buzzard. And again, it's just some garages. And often they repurpose buildings or threw them up on uh, school playgrounds quite often. So in Chingford, they had substations for the AFS at Oak Hill, Selwyn Avenue, which was a school playground, uh, Larkswood Road, Walthamstow Avenue, Hitcham's Dairy, and the Xylonite Factory in Hyams Park, where they made ping pong balls. Um, so these buildings probably looked something like these. The next image I absolutely love. Uh, this is from Kent. It's North Fleet, I think, in Kent, and it's the auxiliary fire service for that region. Uh, and you can see what they've got as their fire station. It is a caravan. 
Uh, so it, 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 it's a wheeled structure. They've put some corrugated iron on the front, some sandbags on the roof, a tarpaulin over the end, popped a shed next to it and bish bash bosh, got yourself an auxiliary fire station. So, I mean, this is, this is a time of great trouble and they're, they're putting all the resources they can into it. And in some places that's better than others. So that's the AFS operating from a caravan. Um, the fire service was nationalized in 1941. So after the aerial bombardment began, they realized that having these two overlapping systems, these different 1,668 brigades wasn't working and they just nationalized the, not, the whole lot in 1941. So that's the first time that firefighting provision was organized nationally. Um, here, I'm sure everyone will be able to tell me on the right that that is a green goddess. Uh, and on the left, another image that I really love it is um, uh, a trailer. So the London Fire Brigade provided these all over the place. Um, and it is a trailer with a uh, water tank and uh, pipes and hoses and useful bits of kit. Uh, and it is attached to the back of a taxi in this instance. So it, you can attach it to anything. You could just use it. And that was, that was the main thing during the wartime period that they, they were most concerned about. Um, so the National uh, Fire Service, the NFS, came to an end in 1948, and where there had been 1,668 brigades, they reinstated 157. So they simplified things somewhat, um, and at that time Chingford came into the Essex County Fire Service. Uh, Chingford is no longer in Essex, but Essex still has a fire service, and they have a fantastic museum, which I would heartily recommend to you. Um, they are responsible for building this very lovely building in chief. I think it's lovely. Most people probably wouldn't look twice at it. It looks like a library, it looks like a 60s school, something like that. But it, it, I, I like these fire stations. They're very plain, they're, they're very functional, very utilitarian. And actually you can go up and down the country and find buildings that are very similar. So you've got Swindon on the left there, you've got Orpington and you've got Hayes. And all of those buildings, architecturally, they're all incredibly uh, similar. Um, so in 1965, Chingford became part of London. Here are some of our London firefighters, uh, socially distanced outside Chingford Fire Station recently. Um, they're part of the Waltham Forest Command. So Chingford, Leighton, Leighton Stone and Walthamstow. Um, they attended 667 fires in the borough last year and 762 special service call outs. And that could be anything from uh, you know, where the ladders needed to get a cat from a tree to a road traffic accident, major motorway pile up, anything like that. Um, so that brings us up to the present, um, almost. This is 2016 when uh, firefighting in Chingford, a little bit of history was made. This chap is Mark Archer of the Blue Watch at Chingford and his daughter, Victoria Archer Lee, who's usually based at the fire station in Shoreditch. Um, they're believed to be London's only father-daughter firefighting combo. Um, and in January 2016, Miss Archer Lee was called to stand by at Chingford, meaning she and her father were based at the same fire station and rode on the same fire engine for the first time. First time that's ever happened anywhere. Um, often you have, uh, you read in the Victorian period, you know, long traditions of, uh, of fathers and sons going in, family traditions of being firefighters. But this seems to be the first recorded uh, evidence of a father and daughter firefighting team, and it was Chingford. So, uh, what a great place to come to an end. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you, someone's still there and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, rather rattle bag tour through the history of fire stations. I'm very happy to answer any questions that can pop up in the chat. Um, you can find me on Twitter. That's my handle there, Inspector Billy, or you can come through the Historical Society. I'm sure they'll be happy to pass on any inquiries that come to you later. But in the meantime, uh, very happy to answer anything that is at hand straight away and uh, stop share there we go okay billy thank you very much indeed uh, for that fascinating talk and um i certainly um learned a few things about chink for actually so uh, yeah that was absolutely fascinating so let's um let's now go out to um, the audience and um if anyone has a question please do raise your hand uh, for billy and um Joanna, would you like to take on insurance plaque? Can I just shout out Wendy Jones uh, for the sun insurance plaque that's being held up? I'm loving that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, this comes, I'm pretty sure, I've got the details somewhere from a house in Norfolk. Uh, my mother picked it up in an antique shop. And since I worked for Sun Alliance at the time, it seemed fairly appropriate to get it for me. Yes, and it's lovely to see that it's still painted. They were always painted gold yep. and blue. Uh, and the paint, when they're on buildings, the paint's always worn off now, so no one appreciates that. But, well, I um, repainted it, and for some years, it was on the inside of all of our cottage in Norfolk. When we I sold the it. we brought it back to Chingford. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I apologise, and thank you, Joanna, for the point you made in the uh, chat there that I put the wrong picture of Friday Hill House uh, in my talk. So I apologise for that. It was a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think it looked like the 1830s, but that, that's the problem with online research. You, you yeah. can't, Billy, you uh, Billy, can I just point to the, uh, the the latest Friday Hill House here? Can you see that? Let me pin you so I can see it. Can oh, see yes, that? look at it. Yeah, OK. And then um, he also built um, the church, which you can probably just see in this picture here. OK. Uh, the Lumley, yeah. So there you are. OK. Uh, questions, please. I think Vera Baker had her hand up a moment ago. Um, yeah, my, my father was in the auxiliary fire service wow. and I've actually got some photographs in front of me now. Wow. Um, you, you said it was Larks Wood Road, but I think you'll find it was Larks Hall Road. And it's oh, where- Oh, my Larks apologies. Hall. That's because there is a Larks Wood Road as well. Um, yeah. But it's in front of the, what was now the pub. Um, I'm going to get your email and send you because I don't know what this sort of machine is in front of them. Wow. You might be I'd interested. Love to see that. I've also got, um, a, well, they're very old, obviously, um, loads of them being inspected by Admiral Sir Edward Evans. Okay. And um, uh, he wasn't the Evans that um, disappeared. Uh, on the, on, on the Antarctic exhibition, that, that was also in Evans, but he was in one of the supply ships that right. went on that exhibition. But we found out that this is Admiral Sir Edward Evans, and my father is right by him, in front of where they built the old, the, the original fire station. Fantastic. I'd love to see the, uh, the pictures, if you can share them. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'll, Vera, I'll email you with Billy's uh, Contact me now, and, and you'll have to wait till one of my sons comes and scans them because I haven't got. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, there is a question in the chat from Tim. Um, he, uh, he missed the date that the station by the town hall was opened. Oh, uh, 19, I want to say 1929. Is it, 20, it's the same, 29. Yeah, mm -hmm. the same date as the town hall. So they'd have been building it in uh, 28 and then. I think it was officially opened in 1929. Do you, uh, do you happen to know when it was demolished? I don't. It was, they did work there later. They added, I don't know the history of the building terribly well, but I know they added some extra bits around the back and I don't know if it was adapted at that time, but certainly it was in use until uh, the new one was built, uh, which was 59 or 60, yeah, no, 57. The new one was built at 57 and it's just sort of next door, isn't it? Um, so at that time, then the old uh, fire station area right by the town hall uh, would have been redundant. So presumably they, they would have changed it, adapted it or demolished it there. Does anyone else um, want to ask a question? Oh, Jennifer. Have you got your hand up, Jennifer? I'm not sure. <laughs> She's, you, you need to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. You're, you're still muted. My mother, my mother wants to know what the pay and conditions were like. In which period? Um, early time. Uh, yeah, very poor. It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, um, thanks, Tony, thanks so much. Tony, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, I can remember the um, fire station by the uh, town hall, and from my memory, they built the new fire station at the co junction with College Gardens, so that they could then build the new town hall annex uh -huh, next okay. to the existing town hall. 
right. um, from memory, it opened in the early 60s. So I think that it was yeah. probably closed when they built the new fire station, demolished, and then the, the annex was built. Um, but another quick comment, if you're interested, because you mentioned Waterloo Fire Station. Yes. Um, and I was working um, with the company that now owns the, uh, or did own the, the fire station when they redeveloped it in the last decade or so. Okay. And when they got in there, they found the back wall who was moving away from the rest of the building. So it, <laughs> well, it's built on a it, marsh it, down there at Waterloo. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, it's built on marsh. So it's not yeah. quite surprising. So, you yeah. know. But yeah, of course, they did a good job of building sort of imp impressive looking, imposing Edwardian buildings, but that doesn't yeah. stop them from falling over when they're built on gravel. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the big problem with the job was that the um, floor of the engine house was um, listed. Yes. And it had to be all protected for yes. the obvious reasons. So it's, um, yes. And I it mean, is they, an interesting building. It is. The floors were, were really interesting. They, so if, if something in the fire brigade is, isn't working, and it can be anything from a computer monitor, they'll, have, they'll call it off the run, which means it's broken. Uh, and that's because the floors leading to the doors were ever so slightly sloped. Um, and when the, so that helped the, the horses and the equipment get out of the door quicker. Um, so that is called the run and anything that's on the run is ready to go, like ready to be, you know, out on a call. Anything that's broken, be it a telephone or a kettle, is called off the run. So they have their own, they have, they have their own lingo. And going back to the previous question, actually, the, um, a lot of the early um, recruits to the Victorian Fire Brigade were from the Navy because they were considered, you know, good at working at heights, good at working in dangerous situations. Um, and they were required to comply with a curfew. It was men only in those buildings. They, they had to be in at a certain time. And the whole architecture of the Victorian fire stations is, is, is there to reinforce that. But the tower is there so they can be sent to climb up it and down it as practice. It's still called a drill tower to this day. Um, and yeah, the conditions were, were, were really poor. The, they were often drawn from the from the Navy and um, they had to work really hard, bless them. It's, it's hard to try and look at everybody's picture to see if anyone's got their hands up. I can't see, I can't see any more. Can you, can anyone else? Oh, can you see that, Billy, can you see the comment in the chat? Yes. So Francis met five firefighters from Chingford today doing an inspection and they were impressed. Oh, that's great. They're impressed. Yeah. Really talk about the I, I actually met them whilst I was taking shopping to a lady that lives there uh -huh. and I was waiting to go in the lift and there were five firefighters there. And I'm like, oh, my God, you can't mm -hmm. all get in the lift at the same time. And I said, I'm really glad I've seen you because I should be seeing something about your station tonight. Like, What's that all about then? So they didn't have a clue. Uh, but they went, oh my God, we're going to be, we're going to be on the video. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so they were right. very impressed, very chuffed, yeah. They're so lovely. friendly. They're such a lovely bunch of fire brigades. Yeah, really and, lovely. Um, very you, it, it's not very well known, but if you go, if you walk up to a fire station and tell them that you're interested in fire prevention, they will chat to you. They will yeah. like probably bring you in, talk, you know, give you loads of chat. They they come and check your fire alarms for you. They'll do all sorts of stuff. You, yeah, I had them in my house to do that. Yeah, it was yeah, interesting. They're, they're really warm and opening, and people walk past these buildings and think, oh, I'd better step past quickly in case the engine comes out the door. But um, <laughs> actually, they they're really trying to increase the like uh, having a, a room that they can bring the public into, so they go and talk to the Cub Scouts and the uh, guides and. All sorts of organisations, community organisations that they connect with. Yeah, um, they're they're really great. I did. I, I, I was, have a, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, I used to work in the town hall that you mm. showed where the old fire station was, yes. but way way after the fire station was demolished. Yeah, right. but really good, lovely talk this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. If anyone's interested in the subjects, because I've sparked an interest, I can recommend free books for you. Uh, the first one is uh, London Fire Stations by John Nadal. This is quite specialist. Chingford is in there. Um, it's not like written history. It's a, a sort of resource. So it has a picture of every fire station in London in chronological order and information about 
uh, how many types of um, the type of equipment and how many people were there in each one. The second recommendation would be this fantastic leaflet, the Chingford Fire Brigade, which I believe is a, historic, a Chingford Historical Society publication. Which Gary very kindly uh, sent me a copy of and is now going in my prized special fire station resource shelf. Um, and uh, so I'm going to treasure that. Uh, and the first one, third one is my little book on, on the subject. It's just called Fire Stations by Billy Redding, published by Amberley. Um, Chingford isn't in that one, sadly, but um, if you buy a copy, maybe I'll come and draw a picture of Chingford Station inside it for you. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that is available for all good bookshops and online. I'm not very good at promoting myself, but um, the book's out there. So. I can um, uh, include references to those three books on an email round to everybody. That's great. So, Billy, um, may I ask a couple of questions, please? Please, yeah. Um, so, the early pump, um, the barrel um, pumps that you mentioned yes. at the very beginning, are there still examples of those that you can go and see? Um, yes, that's a really good question. The London, uh, the, sorry, the Museum of London did a big exhibition for this um, anniversary of the Great Fire, and they recreated one. So. There are uh, early fire engines, which look kind of different to that. They tend to be a sort of column um, and the pumps inside. So the water isn't held in a, in a reservoir, it's connected in. Right. Um, and those you can see about the place, they'll have them in fire brigade museums. A couple of churches, uh, London city churches have them in. St Magnus Martyr has one, um, but the big sort of barrel engine, uh, the Museum of London, made one to see what it would be like as part of the exhibition for the Great Fire. And so they have that. They may not have it on show, but if you really want to see it, you email them, they'll probably take you to the store and you can have a look. Great. It's a fantastic thing. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Um, and my next question was about the fireman's pole. Now I'd assume <laughs> yes. that with with the later and um, more ornate fire stations, uh, the Victorian an Edwardian period, that was, would I would assume would be when they would be introduced, would have been introduced? Correct. The Fireman's Pole is a American invention. The first one was in Chicago and it was made of varnished wood, which had a tendency to splinter. So they very quickly replaced it with metal, but uh, it was invented by an American chap. And the London County Council did a, a fact finding mission, I think we can say work jolly, to New York in the, in I think 19, between 1901 and 1904, Owen Fleming was in charge then. And he went over with his architect mates and had a jolly good time. And they saw these New York fire stations that were very tall, thin buildings, um, which they could use because they were using the pole. So you could get from the top to the bottom when the call came in very, very quickly. Uh, and so the pole was really, changing the shape of the, the fire stations and these urban fire stations uh, were very quick to, to adopt that. The very first one in London was in Kensington and if you look at a picture of Kensington fire station the front is three stories tall and very very thin. Um, I didn't show a picture of it I'm afraid um, but yeah that was the first place that a pole was introduced to a London fire station. Of course I forget that everybody who thinks of fire stations thinks of firemen's poles. They don't use them anymore because they're a health and safety um, hazard. You're more likely to break your ankle than save three seconds. So um, they tend to, if they build stations now, limit them to two, uh, ground and first floor and they, they tend to have them, uh, ev everything sort of spread out. They need bigger sites. So they just realize that actually that works better and that's what they should do. So they don't, they don't use poles anymore, but the older stations do still have them. Great, okay. That's fantastic, Billy. Thank you very much for that. I don't have any more questions. Um, any a last chance for anyone out there who may have a question for Billy before we finish? No? Fantastic. Well, Billy, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, talking uh, to the Society today. Fascinating uh, talk. As I say, we haven't had one like this for well, that I know of, so it's certainly a subject that uh, has interested me. And um, I think you should give a little round of applause for Billy. Thank you very much indeed, Billy. Thank, oh, thank you. Really fine. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. It's, it's been really fantastic, and I was honoured to be asked. So thanks so much.